No one puts the Yule in Yuletide quite like Bergman. This is Fanny and Alexander. You know, I was at the Beverly Center, and they're already playing Christmas music. I'm not even kidding. Holy shit. Horrible. That's why I don't go to the Beverly Center. I had to do something for my boss. Yeah. I, I never... Trust me, you will never find me at the Beverly Center if I don't have to be there. Hi, everybody. Hey. Welcome to Seen and Heard. This is the podcast where two lowly entertainment assistants go through the sight and sound top 100 greatest films of all time list. I'm Greg. I'm Jackie. And we're here this week for another Bergman movie. We just <laughs> did one. That. What the heck? I know. It's ping pong. It's ping pong. In fact, two episodes ago, we did Persona. But uh, yeah, I mean, the only reason it wasn't last episode is because housekeeping was a personal print, which is not on the list. So this actually would have fallen right after Persona. So yeah, it's number 84 on the list. It's another tied for 84. I really think they should have brought a couple more critics in to break some of these ties because I feel like this is our like millionth 84 You're tie. You're so right. Yeah. And it's kind of just confusing. Because what's the number of votes that receives an 84 ranking? 19 votes. Hmm. They couldn't have interviewed a couple? Well, exactly. Weighed in? Had a exactly. couple more people weigh in? I don't know. Maybe the next list. <laughs> you know, what? what's happening with that next list? We should really like keep an eye out for that because it was supposed to come out in September. That's what I'd heard. I don't think they like officially announced that's when it was supposed to come out, but I think that's when they typically came out in the past. But yeah, we haven't heard yet. We and haven't heard. I hope it doesn't come out during our, our break because we actually are... <gasps> what break? We're taking a month off. We are taking November off. Because uh, we haven't missed an episode since December, except for one because of COVID. <laughs> we missed one in August. Yeah, it was yeah, August. It but longer. before that, we've never missed a week. And yeah, we both, there's things coming up in our personal lives. And we both write and make stuff on the side. And so we thought it would be nice to have a month off to focus on creative endeavors that mm -hmm. aren't the podcast. So we will be taking November, the month of November. There will be no seen and heard, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Sad. But we will be back in December, the first Tuesday in December, December 6th, we will be back. Day after my birthday. Oh, it's December 5th. That's right. Yeah. I forgot. And we'll come back really strong. We're coming back with some really big hitters. Yeah. I think the first one back is Singing in the Rain. So, <gasps> Really? Yeah. Very That's excited. Sweet. Anyway, outside of Fanny and Alexander, what have you been watching lately, Jackie? I saw two movies. There's this A24 movie called God's Creatures that is coming out. It was at Con. I think it's being released next month, but I went to like an early screening of it. It has Emily Watson and Paul Meskel from Normal People. And uh, it's by this director duo, um, Celia Davis and Anna Rose Homer. Oh, I love Anna Rose Homer. Yeah, they I have another movie together where one of them, they, they've never co-directed. This is their first time co-directing, but I think their previous movie, one of them was the editor. I don't know which one. The and movie I've seen of hers is The Fits. That's the one. Yeah. So is she the director? She was the director, yeah. Then Celia is the editor of that movie. And in this movie, they co-directed. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm sad to say it just didn't really do it for me, which is sad because it's such it's a movie that I would like a lot. And I don't really want to give it away because if you say the plot of the movie, you kind of give it away. It takes place in this like small Irish fishing village. Emily Watson's fantastic. I mean, I think she's, she's so underused. She's so, so, so good. And it's kind of breaking the waves esque. They're on this like rock, right? In the Atlantic Ocean. And she's well, she's Irish in this one, but she's not she's Scottish and breaking the waves. But yeah, just very simply without giving anything away, it's trying to achieve something and be this type of movie that I really enjoy, but it falls flat. That's sad to hear. But they're very they seem like they're very capable. The cinematography was really, really good. But yeah, sad. They can't all be home runs. Yeah, but I was looking forward to it because I'm a huge Paul Meskel fan. I don't know if you know this. But <laughs> We've like, talked about it. I still haven't seen normal people. Deeply in love. <laughs> so uh <laughs> anyway, I also saw Don't Worry Darling. <laughs> I finally did it. I went Finally, and saw didn't it. it just come out? Well, the anticipation has been building for so long. 
Um, pretty mediocre. Yeah, it's uh, the story is very subpar, very very subpar. Um, but the production design and the cinematography are beautiful, like really really great. It I feel bad that it's getting such bad reviews because those two departments are so good. Uh, and you know, of course, like the famous Harry Styles line at Con that he says about the movie. No, because it's a movie. I mean, like it's a go to a theater film movie, <laughs> and that's what it is. Like the cinematography and production designer make it like this gorgeous, but very empty spectacle. Um, and yeah, I think not only the scandals surrounding the movie hurt it, but basically the advertising campaign was really detrimental to the movie because in those even in like something that's 10 seconds long, they tell you the plot of the movie and you see all the really like off-putting images in every trailer, you know? So I went there really like knowing what's going to happen. And it's like, they don't even try to make the world seem real. They don't even, not at all, you know? Like, you know what it's about and you have, you've never even seen it. Mm -hmm. That's so bad. (laughs) Like That's horrible. I mean, they used to do that back in the day, too, but I feel like it's gotten to a point now where it's like oh, complete overkill. But yeah. still, some old trailers would give away there like is the entire no, movie. There is no mystery left when you go to see the movie. Really. Um, yeah, it's really unsatisfying. That's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> what did you see? I've been, you know, we're, we're, gear- that's the Halloween. we're fully in the Halloween season, which is one of my favorite times of the year. So I try to watch as much horror stuff as possible, but because of... Uh, you know, my personal schedule, I have not been able to watch as many as I would have liked to, but I did for a first time watch, I did see John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, which I had not seen before. And I'd always heard was good. And for some reason, I just never saw it. And it's from his golden period. It's 1987. So it's like just before they live and stuff. And it was really great. I was really surprised how good it was. It's kind of a mixture of like the thing. It's There's a lot of the thing in it, if it's like this group of scientists that go to this church because this ancient evil has awoken. But in the last act, the last third, it kind of turns into its its own thing entirely. And it's funny because the premise is so silly. It involves this like green canister of goo that's like evil. But the way that he's he takes it so seriously, like I don't think John Carpenter is great with actors. Like he's he has a string of like masterpieces, but I net like performance is not his strong suit. He's not mm-hmm. like an actor's director. There's no like incredible performances from a John Carpenter movie. But his economy of storytelling and the fact that most of his films are like an hour thirty, hour forty minutes, and what he's able to do in that time mm-hmm. is pretty astounding. And uh, this was no exception. I really enjoyed it, and it's funny. It's crazy how he's able to take such a silly premise and make it unsettling and kind of like night there's some nightmare fuel in this movie that like some images that legitimately stuck with me while i was going to bed so really enjoyed that then uh secondly i saw a film called requiem for a village from 1975 by a director named david gladwell so this is kind of um it's a little over an hour long and it's kind of this weird it's almost like a tone poem on this. Basically, this gardener of the cemetery is like trimming grass and flowers and stuff. And he's remembering the people of like the graves he's trimming. Yikes. The problem is it's like it sounds really cool on paper because you kind of get these like impressionistic flashbacks of like these people's mm-hmm. lives, like turn of the century stuff. The problem is the movie is so like, obviously, it looks like it was made for like five dollars. <laughs> and the problem is the sound is so bad. Like, I don't think I've ever heard a movie with like worse like sound recording or like sound editing. Like it sounded wow. like it was underwater. And also there's some kind of unpleasant stuff in there with like some violence and stuff that I wasn't really expecting. And then later I found out that it's c- kind of considered like a folk horror film, which I wasn't expecting at all. So there was some arresting stuff in there overall, though. It was like not a great experience. <laughs> and it just kind of felt like a little too cheap to really do what it was trying to do. But still, like, glad I saw it. And it's even one I might revisit, you know, a few years down the road. Because uh, what it did well, it it did do well. So should we get into this week's movie? Yeah. From 1982. This is Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander.
Fanny and Alexander was released in 1982. It was written and directed by Ingmar Bergman, cinematography by Sven Nykvist, and music by Daniel Bell. In turn-of-the-century Sweden, Alexander Ektel and his sister Fanny grow up in a household of colorful characters. The wealthy Ektels are comprised of the matriarchal grandmother, her boyfriend, the mystical and lovable antique dealer, Isaac, Alexander's womanizing uncle, his actor-slash-theater manager father, his actress mother, and various aunties and cousins, as well as maids and cooks. The family have an idyllic Christmas together, but sadly it becomes Alexander's father's last, as he has a stroke and dies shortly after. His mother then marries the tyrannical bishop, Edward, and Fanny and Alexander must give up their old lives completely and move to the bishop's palace. There, Alexander and Edward butt heads constantly, and his strict ways quickly become abusive. Alexander's mother knows she must end the marriage, but Edward threatens her that she will lose custody of her own children. Through a stroke of magic, luck, or divine intervention, the children are rescued by Uncle Isaac. While the children are in Isaac's care, Edward dies under mysterious circumstances, and Alexander's mother is reunited with the entire Ectel clan. As the story comes to a close, Alexander is visited by the ghost of Edward, who warns him that he will never really be free of him. The film stars Bertil Gouve as Alexander, Pernilla Alwyn as Fanny, Eva Froling as Emily, their mother, Alan Edval as Oscar, their father, Gunn Valgren as Grandma Helena, Jan Malmsjo as the bishop, Erland Josephson as Isaac, Jarl Kule as Uncle Gustav Adolf, and the incredible Harriet Anderson as Justina, one of the maids in the bishop's palace. The film was originally conceived as a miniseries for television, totaling in 312 minutes. However, prior to it actually being released in its entirety, it was cut for theatrical release to 188 minutes. This theatrical version was distributed to 30 countries, and it opened in the U.S. in June of 1983. The 312-minute version was released in Swedish theaters in 1983, and then it subsequently aired as a miniseries in Sweden. Which is, so when we talked last week about which version we're going to watch, it it was really unclear on Sight and Sound's website. Naturally, I thought the theatrical version, but then when I started looking into it and I learned that the 312 minute version, the five hour version was released in theaters, I was really confused. Mm -hmm. So we did go with the theatrical version for this episode because it just seems the most natural well, in in terms of, I don't know about you, but I'll be talking about the extended version too, because that's the one, like, to prep for this, you and I both watched the theatrical version, which was the first time for both of us seeing the theatrical. Mm-hmm. But I want to talk about the it we as will. a whole and not yeah. just talk about the theatrical. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But so the film was nominated for six Oscars, director, screenplay, foreign language film, art direction, cinematography, and costume design. And it won everything but director and screenplay. So for best foreign film, it was the 188 version, the theatrical version. Right. I don't like, know. It just seemed natural to me that for sight and sound, for the best movies of all time, it would be this like movie version. But then also the five hour version has played in theaters. Yeah. Like, but that with was no breaks. Yeah. Well, oh. <laughs> I don't know. The problem is that I think that was a much more limited thing and it was only in Sweden, whereas the theatrical version played many countries in that version. And later when we read Pauline Kael's review, she's reviewing the theatrical okay, version. Now I feel better. Um, originally, Liv Ullman was set to play the mother, Emily, and Max von Sydow was going to play the bishop. However, it didn't work out. Uh, apparently, Ingrid Bergman was in mind for the grandma, but I think she was already sick at this point, and uh, she wasn't able to to appear in the film, which is so sad. Simultaneous to shooting the film, Bergman made a documentary called The Making of Fanny and Alexander. Have you seen it? You know what? I have not. Me neither, and I really <laughs> wanted to before this episode, Me but too. I just didn't have I, time. Same, same. I really, I, I'll probably watch it like during Christmas time. Uh, The film was shot in Uppsala, Sweden, where Bergman was born and raised. And much of the film is admittedly by Bergman, biographical. Bergman's father was a strict Lutheran priest who often punished him and challenged his imaginative ways. And actually, did you know this? He was the royal chaplain to the court of the Swedish king at the time. Yeah. uh Sweden still has a royal family, by the way. Yeah. Which is so, like, you just never hear about it. And this was Bergman's last feature film. He continued to write scripts and he directed made-for-television projects, but 
in terms of features, which it really isn't even a feature. Because Sarah Bond did not come out theatrically? No. It oh, was it was made for TV movie. Oh, I didn't know. That. For some reason, yeah. I thought it was theatrical. He also wrote, I just learned about this. He wrote a movie that was directed by someone else after Fanny and Alexander. And it's kind of like seen as like in the same vein because it's about his parents and the courtship of his parents. And he wrote it and just gave it to this director saying like, you direct it, which is so Yeah, he did funny. say at this point in his, in his career, he said that theatrical films were too much like emotionally and physically for him. He was 64, which mm-hmm. to, by today's standards, you know, you have people in their 80s like William Friedkin, I think, is 87 and just mm-hmm. announced he's directing another movie. So by today's standards, he's still a young man. Yeah. But he cited that, you know, I'm still going to do theater and stuff like that. I'm still going to write, but I just can't make films anymore. Yeah. What are your initial thoughts? I just want to say <laughs> it felt weird watching this in October. Yeah, it did. <laughs> because this uh, this is such a December movie. <laughs> such a December movie. And I first saw this it was when I lived at home. I saw this like uh, probably 10 plus years ago. And the way I watched it was the TV version, was the miniseries version, which is nice. It's four episodes, I think. It's four. You know what's so weird to me? I was looking back on my like, because I like take notes when I watch movies a lot. And I was I was looking back on my notes for Fanny and Alexander and I divided it by episode and I have five episodes on my notes, even though it's four do you know why that is? I don't know. Wait, Am I just five? tripping? No, I think it's... F- yeah, four. It's four, right? Mm-hmm. No, but look, here it says five. Where? On IMDb, it says five. Criterion breaks it down into four. Then maybe I watched it on HBO Max, and on HBO Max, it's... No, I mean, when I saw it, it was... Every time I've seen it, it's been four episodes. And uh, it's very digestible because no episode is over ni- like 90 minutes long. Mm-hmm. And this is like, because it's a five-hour epic in, mm-hmm. in that version. And so, yeah, I first saw this 2012, something like that. And <laughs> I mean, what's there to say? It, it was every, it, it's everything. And um, especially when watched in December, because December is so full of like, I, I'm such a big subscriber of like, I know we've talked about this before. It's almost become a joke at this point. Like the, the whole ghost stories for Christmas thing, like the British tradition. I think it's not, it's not just British. It's a European tradition yeah. of ghosts being part of Christmas time. Mm-hmm. And so stuff kind of should be a little dark. That's why I love Christmas Carol so much. I love mm-hmm. the Dickensian the stuff mm-hmm. because it brings in that dark element. Speaking mm-hmm. of, you have to, this holiday season, you have to watch Muppet Christmas Carol. <laughs> um, so this is like a perfect, because you have such huge festivities in the beginning and it's just so christmasy and then the 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 depths that it goes to how Mm -hmm. dark it gets Mm -hmm. and how bleak and pauline calls it a gothic horror at at some points and it it gets to though it gets really hopeless before the end it brings you back up into this you know celebration again so i for me it is like the perfect christmas film Mm -hmm. it is and you know what's interesting to me that i noticed this time like even the next morning, so like Christmas Eve is really fun, right? And they're having a great time and obviously it's a holiday. And then of course at night you kind of get a glimpse into each of the little families and their issues like Carl Gus- uh, Carl and his uh, wife, the German wife, and how he's so mean to her and obviously Gustav Adolf and May. But Christmas morning is so dark in this movie. They- they're sitting at the table and they're all quiet and it's a dimly lit room and it's it's very heavy Christmas morning. Yeah. It is. And usually Christmas morning is like the ultimate joy. Well, I think you everybody's hung over from the night before and nobody got any sleep. But <laughs> still, still, like it was a conscious it starts, choice. It starts and then the transition. It sure. does, especially when they're going to church and it's dark. And yeah, it's like pretty because they're all, it's all candlelight and it's pretty, but it's not joyful at all. Yeah, because you know morning. Oscar is dying. You know yes. that he's dying and but he's I, not I well. But I even love that, that like even mm-hmm. the Christmas part, even the next day, right. Christmas day is right. dark. Yeah. Um, no, I I mean I think it's it, it's it's really like the ultimate epic. I mean Bergman intended intended this to be his swan song. This it was is. and it is. Of course he still made a few things after this, but this is the summation of Bergman's career. And I was going to say that's my initial thought. That's that's really this what is it a is. It's magnum opus in every sense of the word. Yeah, no, exactly. But like all the themes that he was grappling with exactly. his whole career come it, forward. And it blows here. my mind how seamlessly this man was able to put everything he's ever made movies about or thought about artistically into one giant masterpiece. It's a miracle. And I mean that in like a technical way and also a spiritual way. 
Yes. It's incredible. Yes, absolutely. Um, It's novelistic and it's cinematic at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's just... and Okay, and this is also part of my initial thoughts. This was my first time seeing the theatrical version. I thought we were still on my initial thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought we had merged into wow. mine. Um, excuse me, but wow. That we just have such good... We're just vibing I think right I, now. I think I'd kind of said... I know I'm trying to keep my initial thoughts a little shorter, but <laughs> no, I think that that's kind of my, my general impression was just that it, it is. So as soon as it's, it's, you know what it is. My biggest takeaway from this movie when I first saw it was like, it felt like something that's always existed, mm. not just, and it, it was hard for me to believe that this film com- came from the eighties, like came from that I decade. Know. And also like, cause I was born six years later and it's, it, this feels so timeless. And so like, it's just like like it was always there, yes. and it's so it's just hard for me to believe that. But yeah, I I this is one of my all time favorite movies. in In the five hour version, this is absolutely like a top five, if not top five, top ten for sure film for me, and yes. it's my favorite Bergman film. Yeah, I wonder if it's mine. I don't. I don't think I have one. Your favorite Bergman? Yeah, that's fine. Not to have one. <laughs> um, this is totally up there, though. Like, definitely, definitely up there. I will say though, for my initial thoughts, adding on to everything I've just said, first time seeing the theatrical version, I think it generally gets the job done, except Isaac's story, because that is key to me. Isaac's story. It's not even just Isaac's story. It's Carl Chen's story too. Exactly. Like, the theatrical version abandons Carl. It does. Before we started, I I literally said to Greg, I'm like, why do I remember Carl being in this more? And then I was like, oh, wait, duh. But I think you're nicer to the theatrical version than I am. I am like, because I think that it gets the job done. But I would say that, too. But like in that in the roughest possible way, like it gets the job done, but it's not ideal. And I yeah. think ultimately because we're missing two hours. But for a family to sit down and watch this in one night. Yeah, do it. I don't know. <laughs> the problem is you lose just really, really key stuff. Oh. And Bergman even talks about like having to cut two hours out was like cutting into the connective tissue. Of well, the, we're going to talk about this. Of the but film. Yes. Isaac's story makes me like so emotional and cry so much that when this was over, I'm like, wait, why am I not crying? And then I realized. Because <laughs> you're missing a bunch of stuff. Yeah. The theatrical version is like a trailer for the longer version. I mean, it's more than that. I know that sounds crude. <laughs> I, I'll tell you this, though. I went into the theatrical version expecting to just hate it. I know, because you're annoying. No, because you're cutting two hours out from something I love, and it's been a part of like almost every Christmas I've had over the last 10 years. Uh-huh. I, I watch this like every year. So every se- single year? There's maybe been one or two years where I didn't, where I skipped. Because maybe Molly was like, no, th- I don't feel like it this year. <laughs> Sorry, Molly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I try to watch this every December. Over okay. a couple, I, I watch one episode yeah. at a time. I yeah. don't try to do it all at once. No. Because it's a beautiful experience. And for me, it is like the spirit, coming from someone who's not religious at all, yeah. I love Christmas. And I yeah. love just the light and dark that exists mm-hmm. in that mm-hmm. time of year. And I think this perfectly encapsulates it. But so yeah, I went into the theatrical version being like, oh, fuck. But I, to my surprise, yeah. it do, like just what you said, it gets the job done, but nothing more. But that nothing more is already fantastic. The problem is, yes, <laughs> if the longer version didn't exist and I only saw theatrical, I would still love it. I would it. still love it. Yes, but because I I know what what's missing and I know what it could ultimately be, I just can't, I would I don't think I'll ever watch theatrical again. Okay, would let's, you? No, not if I don't have to. But if my family said like, "Okay, yes, let's watch Fanny and Alexander." And we're down to sit down for three hours. Down to sit down. Well, I would say yes. Here's the thing, right? But in the miniseries version, no episode is more than an hour and a half. That's almost that more digestible. Getting everyone together for four nights, though, and I don't know if that's feasible. That's true. And you, <laughs> you know what? The thing about this one too. Some people talk about it. It's not until the until Oscar dies and the family goes to live with the bishop that it really starts to get this like narrative pull. And I could see in the beginning with just the it the first episode of this, the first 90 minutes, it's just Christmas, Christmas. celebrations. Mm-hmm. And I could see it's like the wedding scene in The Godfather that mm-hmm. opens the film mm-hmm. where like you're like, okay, but what's next? Not that I ever felt that way. Like I'm I'm there swimming and all that Christmas stuff. But like it's not until the bishop stuff that it really starts to get, you start to get really engrossed in like what's happening. Yeah. Because the first part is just introductory. It's 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 setting everybody up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about like the general differences between the series and the film. But let's not get into too much detail because I don't want to spoil it for people. 
Well, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't think that saying anything in the extended version will spoil what's you know not here. I want them to be moved. I don't want them to know what's going to move them. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the main things was like cutting mom from the theater, especially after um, yes. the dad dies. She has uh-huh. a great part. Like it shows you the part that she plays in the theater more. Mm-hmm. And of course you still have the ending, which is great. But have you noticed, did you notice in this one, there was a fade out after each episode? Yeah. Yeah. I, I caught little, that too. A little, uh, yeah, not super graceful actually. Yeah. I didn't mind it. They cut out the ghosts in the attic. Okay, in the that's house. one of my biggest that's, ones. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> you knew that. Go it's ahead. a big, big one. It's a huge one. And it cuts out mom. That be- the one of the most famous. Like when you look up images of Fanny, Fanny and Alexander, one of the most famous images is Fanny, Alexander, and their mom in a bed, like hiding from the bishop. Yeah. And it's cut in this. One of my, that was that yeah. was atrocious to me. One of that my, I was mad. That's about. a huge omission. Is like the bishop stuff does not go on quite long enough because i feel like when you watch the extended version you're so like beat down by the bishop stuff because it's just nastiness that continues on and on and on and initially emily when she moves in she's like very strong-willed and like don't talk to my kids that Mm -hmm. way and do this but then she starts to get beaten down too and there's this whole stretch in the extended version where she's just like complacent and like letting this stuff happen and it takes a while like she almost has to be shook like don't what are you doing like stop letting this happen like you need to get out of there Mm -hmm. whereas in theatrical very quickly she's like oh i need to go yes she's just at grandma's you don't even see her yeah you don't get that scene and also stuff with like oscar like because it's it's such a big deal that he dies he's not just like this unseen dad that passes away the story the story story with the chair christmas time the chair Yes, exactly that was what i was gonna mention and i get why they cut it if you're making a three-hour movie you're not gonna keep this like five or six minute speech about this chair especially and then we have Isaac's story at the end again these like storytelling the storytelling moments but But that's it's those moments the movie exactly it's storytelling and it's performance again we just talked about this in um in pers- our episode for persona but this movie because bergman comes from the theater and this film is about a family of performers and actors like it's so much a part of the fabric of the movie it is the main i think it's the main theme of the movie it's like theater art escapism and storytelling all this beautiful and i love the metaphor that they use in the movie dad the oscar the dad says it during his speech to his theater about the little world right and that's what this whole movie is about it's about the little world yes and it opens i love that the first thing that we read because it's the first thing that's subtitled it's like alexander's miniature theater and there's like something there's an inscription above it that says not for pleasure alone and it's like that's the movie that's the movie it's like yes yeah art is escapism but it's not just escapism and even Oscar, he says it in his speech. He says, I don't know, you know, like sometimes here we're recreating the world. Sometimes people come here to escape the world. And it's this like, ugh, it's just perfect. Well, and this movie straddles the line too between the two because you yes, have stuff that is very enjoyable and then you have much darker stuff. One, one other thing, just before we move on from the cut stuff that was cut, one oh, yeah, huge yeah. omission to was a scene where Carl and Adolf Gustav, Gustav Adolf, go to, go the, bishop to the bishops and hilarious. try to bargain with yeah. him for the for Emily back. Uh-huh, and it's uh-huh. this long scene. And it's funny. It's funny, yeah. And you're missing that. And then, yeah, again, a lot of stuff with Carl Chen is just completely cut from the film. Yes. It's almost like in the theatrical version, why even start to flesh him out? Why even have him with that first argument first, with, his, yeah. with his wife? Exactly. If you're just going to completely just forget be, about him after yeah. that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I know that's a hard scene too to watch, like him and his wife, him being mean to his wife. He, yeah, he's a really, uh, <laughs> he's a tricky character. And he's like so pathetic and has so much self hatred and is so self destructive. Yeah. And uh, he looks like Guillermo del Toro also. Oh my God, <laughs> you're so right. <laughs> you're so right. And, and Oscar looks like Gary Oldman, especially yes! when Gary Oldman had like the mustache. I couldn't get. Yeah. Every time I see this movie, I'm like, that's Gary Oldman and that's Guillermo del Toro. Yes. <laughs> Oscar's like pretty old. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe Emily's just very young. I, she I mean, probably it was supposed had to be Liv Ullman, so. It was supposed to be Liv Ullman. And also, the re- Liv Ullman, they asked her today, or they asked her a few years ago, like, why didn't you do and it? She's and she's like, like, I don't know. She's like, I don't know. It's a good <laughs> question. And the reason Max von Sydow was not the bishop is because of his agent was trying to, like, get yeah. more money. But then don't you think Max should have just stepped up and be like, I have to do this. This is Bergman's, like, swan song. Well, no, like apparently he didn't know that his agent was playing hardball. 
And then he found out that someone else was cast. Weren't they really close? And apparently like... Max von Sydow fired his agent after that. That's what I heard. That's the story. <gasps> I love that. But I do love that Jan Malmsmo is, because he was like primarily a comedic actor. Oh. And he was like in musicals and stuff. He's like a singer. <laughs> so this is like, it's like if Steve Martin, remember Steve Martin in uh, Little Shop of Horrors? Yes. <laughs> as, the dent, as the sadistic dentist. Yes, but he's still funny. He's still that. funny and yeah. he's still singing. It's kind of, you know, obviously this is like a straight drama, but yeah. it's like seeing Steve Martin yeah. do this role. That's yeah. what it would be like. He's so good. He's when really the bishop good. breaks down, I actually get like kind of emotional, which is. At the end, when he's taking the sleeping I can't pills, see. Yes. yeah, that that gets me. Yeah, because which is strange, but that's the beauty of the movie. Yeah, well, he again, he is this very like larger than life villain, but he is still a person. Exactly. Let's go back to like the the main theme, the whole like theater storytelling. So yeah, we said like he's merged the literal theater in the story with this concept of escapism of a preference for storytelling to the real world, and. And then it has like all this great stuff about like playing roles. And again, we're back to persona, right? It's what he's always done. Like it's seeing life through storytelling and philosophy. Like I love when Emily, the mom says Alexander like, oh, and of course there's a show within the show. And of course it's Hamlet. Yeah. And she tells Alexander like, come on, like don't play Hamlet. And he's like recognizing it. And then even the mom, the grandma, I'm sorry, was an actress. And she says like, I, you know, everyone always plays roles. Again, this is something that they literally say in Persona. And she says, like, but I loved the role of the mom more than the actress. And it was like, it's just all so great. And, like, it that's what I mean. It's like, how do you make this so cohesive? And it's not like this is an isolated theme. Not just, like, in his filmography, but in this movie. Because it's also, like, it's tied so closely to this other theme of, like, imagination and childhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it's also tied so closely to this concept of his about, like... The supernatural and like spirits and God and life after death. And it's all just perfect. And (laughs) let's say, too, I do know this is one where I did read Pauline's review ahead of time. Usually I try to keep it for like reading it on the podcast. Mm -hmm. It's like my first time hearing it. I do know she's kind of mixed about the movie. Spoiler alert. We'll get into it later. Of course. But one of her big problems with the film is that it's this warmer more gentler Bergman. She's like, how did the Bergman that made the that made the Silence films and Virgin Spring like make this film? But that's that's why I love it so much. Me is that it too. it is gentler. Me too. And of course, I think as people age, they get gentler. People lose this edge. Yeah. Not like Bergman was super edgy or anything. No. But like, yeah, he made some rough movies. Like <laughs> Virgin Spring is a rough film. Every glass darkly is really hard. Yeah. No. And uh, Cries and Whispers? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, that's why I love Fanny and Alexander so much, is that he's bringing all these themes together, but he's doing it with a gentler touch. Yes. And of course, like the bishop clashes with Alexander most in this aspect. He tells him, like, you can't distinguish lies from the truth. And Alexander's such a storyteller. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Just quickly, I love that Alexander's big moment that he like gets to, it's like when he's telling um, Harriet Anderson. I was just going to say, let's talk about it, that scene. Yeah. So he regales this story about how he yes. saw the two ghosts yes. of the young daughters. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I think he sees the mother too, right? The, yeah. The and ghost she of says, the like, he killed my kids. Exactly. Yeah. And that's like Alexander's first moment where he gets to like captivate an audience. Exactly. And Harriet Anderson is the key to this scene because she plays it (laughs) so well. First of all, she's like acting like she doesn't want to talk to them. Or actually, here's the thing. She's like working for the bishop, right? And like spying on the kids for him. But she also is like so intrigued and her face. Can I just say? She's engrossed. When she she is engrossed and she is engrossing. The first moment yeah. you see her, she's so weird looking. She's got these like contorted hands and she's doing something instantly captivating. And how amazing for her to play this like really ugly role after she, like, come on, she's Monica. Monica. She is Monica. Yeah. And she does it so well. And so that scene with Alexander, first of all, I love when he offers her a cookie. Oh, yeah. To get, to get her to talk a little bit. And she sits down and she's just totally engrossed in she's him. got those and she's glasses like, and like her face the glasses like aren't on totally yeah. straight yeah and her bloody hand and the, the hand that she claims a doorknob a doorknob in that house like burned off part of her yes hand. yes and so i think alexander like yes he's a kid but i also think that he's a kid who is gonna be a storyteller because his parents are well, and he's in this family and the whole family um prefers this like lifted reality Rather than actual reality. Yeah, we can we can safely say without much assumption here that Alexander is Bergman. Yes. 
Yes. And yeah, I mean, I even the speech, the speech that Uncle Gustav gives at the end, it's really powerful. Like, it seems like it's just a drunk guy blab blabbering, but like, he summarizes it. He says the Ectels have not come into this world to see through it. We might just as well ignore the big things. We must live in the little world. And he's not even talking about like, I don't even think he was there when Oscar was making that speech about the little world. Uh, is he? I think he is. He there. just means in this little world of like our reality, yes. which is like, yeah, I mean, like he's polygamous and he doesn't really follow societal standards. And how funny I don't that know. one of the most likable characters is the philandering. Yes. Like, when husband. he says we live for supernatural shivers and that's what <laughs> yeah. we watch movies for. Yeah. And that's what we tell stories for. It's true. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk a little bit about how he's kind of a dick, but he's ki also kind of Bergman. Like Bergman had so many mistresses. Yeah. Well, do you know, okay. Outside of Alexander, obviously, do you know who Bergman like really identifies with in this film? The bishop. The bishop. Yeah. And he says, like, in terms of people that are wrestling with their demons yes. and stuff, that there was a lot of him in the bishop. Definitely. And again, I too, I think that's why you feel bad for him when yeah. he's when he's uh like blind. It's sad. I don't know if that like permanently blinded him. No. Or if no, he's no, no, just no, no, like no. it's just he looks so helpless. Like he's psyching himself out too. And here's the thing, like <laughs> When he turns to Alexander and he says, like, I don't hate you, Alexander. I love you. Like, I don't think. Do you think he means it? Yeah. I think that his idea of love is just really twisted. And this, of course, gets back to, like, like we can go really deep into, yeah. like, religion. And I think that he means it. Yeah, I think he means it, too. As fucked up as that is. It's fucked up, but yeah. I think he means it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, he talks about how his childhood was much harsher. and Yes. You know. Going back to like Bergman as Gustav Adolf, though, I feel like it's kind of this fairy tale that he's created of like, yeah, what if I did just act on my impulses and like my mistress and my wife were always like we're friends and my right. mistress was part of the family. And he's like creating this fairy tale almost for him. But then it's so important that at the end, May voices herself and says, like, I'm not happy. I don't want this cafe. He's controlling my life. It's so important that he does that because if he didn't, it kind of just would have been like a dick move. But I she always like. punctuates it with, but he's so nice. I know. <laughs> he's and so why kind. Does he, why does he get so angry when she says, like, why do you think I want anything from you? The no. first night that they're together. So it's because she pulled, she's like joking around with them. She's like, no, I was just kidding. And then the fact that she was just kidding, like, pisses him off because his ego is like kind of fragile. I mean, look she at that. She's just saying she doesn't want a cafe. Yeah, she's like, no. Oh, like she doesn't want to be his long term mistress. Like, like she, just yeah. the, it's honestly, it's more the fact that she was like joking. She says something. He's like, really? And then he's, she's like, no, just kidding. And then he's like taken aback by that. Because yeah. he's, again, he's a man at the turn of the century who, it's this patriarch. Yeah. He's kind of the patriarch because the husband, the, the grandfather's dead. But I feel like grandma's the page, the matriarch. No, like, she is. She holds, she's the glue, but he's, he's the, glue. He's the jovial like man figure. Yes. Because yes. it's not Carl and it's not Oscar. Yes. But no, I do love. Yeah, I think Bergman is in all three of those brothers. Yeah. And I, but I, I hope that there's not a lot of Carl, Carl in Bergman. <laughs> but honestly, any artist can kind of, on a very, very basic level, can identify a little bit with Carl's train of thought. Hopefully, not to like how mean he is and stuff. But this constant like self doubt and like thinking you're nothing. Yes. Like, oh, it totally. Could, it's, totally. It goes to some dark places with him. Yeah. I mean, there's this whole. Well, we'll get back to it. First, I want to talk a little bit about. Emily, the mom. Mm -hmm. So, and like why she marries the bishop. And that whole scene, I think that scene where he tells her, like, you need to leave all your belongings behind. I want you guys to come to me clean and like with nothing. That scene is like so profound to me. And let's just talk about it. I don't, so in that scene, she says, like, you know, I never cared for anything. And you think back to like, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes ago when she was wailing at her husband's body. And it's like, why would she say that to him? And why would she like... Not like a year passed in that time, though. I guess. Yeah, I guess. And I think she's just broken and she needs something to believe in. And I think it all comes back to this little world. She doesn't want to live in the real world. Like, he offers her magic and mystery. Like, right. she just doesn't realize that it's going to be so bland it's almost a critique and, like, of tyrannical. like yes i it's almost a critique of like born again christianity it is for sure it's people to find it in. after a crisis yes exactly. it definitely is but i and then like, look what ends up happening she like the rest of her family 
is like she wants a non-conventional reality and like yes he can technically offer that like he lives in another world um literally and oscar being an actor i mean that's why probably what drew her to him and she herself is an actress yeah he's he's very theatrical it's part of the make-believe it's all exactly. part of make-believe and, and it's yeah she, you're right she just wants to be told what to do like yes. she wants to be controlled i don't even think it's about wanting to be controlled i think she's fascinated by the mystery of this world that he lives in the and Lord. like religion the castle on the hill yeah and also there's, a, just there's even a moat there's a moat there's a moat <laughs> but i think it's also just belief and it's this it's magic like it's right. like she's kind of equating religion with magic right um, there's a lot of otherworldliness. There's a lot you could read into a lot of sort of fairy tale themes in the movie. Like it is the bad guy whisking them away to this castle on the hill yes. with the moat, and like there's a lot of like it's Hamlet. It's yeah, yeah, it's Ham. It's Shakespeare. It's like the Brothers Grimm. That's uh-huh. all that stuff is uh-huh. like all over this. It's... Oh, one omission too we didn't talk about earlier in the very beginning when Alexander's under that table and you see the statue kind of move. He also the sees Grim death. The Grim Reaper. He sees death. I was waiting for that. I was really out. waiting for that. It's cut out of theatrical. Yeah. But no, it's important. I love all the specters. Uh, it's a cliche for me to even talk about at this point, but I've talked before about how much I love dramatic films that incorporate supernatural stuff in like kind of a matter of fact like way. Like magical realism. Yeah, like magical realism. I just I appreciate it because I think too I'm still a kid at heart and I I want the world to be this big unknown place. Like I don't like knowing like nope, that's not a thing. And it won't ever be a thing. And you're like, "But why?" Yeah. So I love the ghost stuff in this movie. It's played in this interesting way where it's very matter of fact. Like they, Fanny and yes. Alexander see their father many times. I love it. But it's not just them. The grandmother sees. Oh, she has a conversation I with Oscar. I love it. Her conversation with Oscar is so beautiful because I love that when she says like, can I hold your hand? And she just reaches out and he's, yeah, like he's a ghost, but he's just like kind of human and kind of temporal and like. Well, he's all in white too. the The father's always yeah. in white. The bishop is in black. Yeah, I love when Fanny first sees him playing piano. Like she just hears a noise and she's like, "Do you hear that?" And then I love the way it's shot because you just follow her leaving the room. You see her eyes like get wide, and then she goes back in the room and she's like, "Alex, come." It's it's amazing. It's handled it really, really, really well it's in really... this in this like half remembered way for like a memory yeah. from childhood. Yeah. It's that's why films that are really able to like get inside a child's mind that that are like for adults yes. are like some of the like think of like Pan's, Pan's Labyrinth. Labyrinth exactly oh, jinx yeah jinx. <laughs> in fact we have one coming up in a couple of weeks we have Spirit of the Beehive yes. which was a which big is influence also Spanish yeah, yeah Spanish big influence on Pan's Labyrinth um one more thing I want to say about Emily the mom and we can kind of like plug this back in if you want um I think that her ending I don't I didn't remember I've only seen the miniseries once wait i don't don't think you told us the first time you watched this like last year was it uh christmas time yeah okay i didn't remember the scene in the end when she goes to grandma and says like let's run the theater together and i love it it's Mm. perfect it's such a a good ending for emily and grandma and i love how they say like oh we're the ones in charge now and it's like now Emily is going to be satisfied. Like she's going to be okay because now she has this, this source of like magic and otherworldliness. That's just hers. It's not dependent on someone else. And it's well, so much of the film, beautiful. so much of the film is like coming back to where you belong. Right. Yeah. Because Bergman is a performer and he's yes. raised in this, but he's forced to move to this creepy house on a hill and he finally comes back. But what I love so much about the ending is that it's not all roses because the bishop, the oh, ghost of the bishop yes. is going to torment Alexander. Yes. And so I like that because to have a, comp- I think if that bishop scene didn't happen at the end where he pushes Alex in the hall, uh, Alex, like I know him, Alexander I'm calling him Alex in the too. hallway. If, if we didn't have that, it would yeah. be too rosy. It be would. Like, okay, they're back. It would be too much of a fairy it tale. Would. So I think having that little bit, because there's never a point in life where you're like, okay, from here on out, it's just amazing. You're like, no, there's still, roadblocks along the way and that's what the bishop yes. represents for alex Definitely. alexander i think that that is so true but i also feel like it's important to think about what the last words of the movie are which are the imagination spins weaving new patterns because it's like the 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 ghost thing has just happened so you can read it like that but you can also read it like oh this is just part of this boy and later man's amazing imagination mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's both. I think it is about like darkness and death. And, well, because like, it's not just Alexander that sees this stuff too. Exactly. It's the grandmother. Exactly. And other people. Yeah. Exactly. And of course, I mean, 
I think it's time to talk about the death. Well, and Harriet of- Anderson also knows that the house is haunted. Yeah. I love her. The, the death. <laughs> Let's talk about, I mean, this has the biggest part to play in the death of Edward because like you can see it in two very different ways. And I think Bergman's point was that you shouldn't see it in either of the ways. You should just see it in like both. (laughs) I mean, like, I don't know. What do you think? Like what specifically? Well, you have Alexander with Ishmael Mm -hmm. doing some sort of like magic witchcraft where Ishmael's telling him that, oh, like, I know you want to kill this person and I see a room and I see fire. And then, of course, you hear the logical explanation of how the bishop died. Mm-hmm. It was his aunt, who, by the way, gives me major, like, cries and whispers vibes. It's played by uh, a man, too. Really? Whereas Ishmael is played by a woman. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, you know, I'm I'm pretty sure that the aunt is played by a man. I I don't want to say with 100% confidence, but I, I, think, I think that. I think but, like, just happened. the way she's, like, Obviously, she's nothing like Harriet Anderson in Cries and Whispers, but like it's something about the nightcap and like dying sick in bed and really a horrible death. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it no. gives me that. But um, I, again, I think too, a lot of adults, a lot of very educated adults like to write off supernatural elements in stories, like plot elements of being yes. like, no, it's just a re- remembrance and. I like to think with that Ishmael stuff, again, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say this is exactly what happens. But yes, I think Ishmael wills the bishop's death into existence. And I th- I think, obviously, like we've seen this house. It could all be fake. Like all the Isaac stuff could kind of be an illusion, except the for ex- the mummy could be an illusion. It could be mechanical, yeah. right? It could be. Like he yeah. has that giant puppet that's yes. God. Yes. The mummy could Which be I fake. Love. I love the mummy too, yes. But the chest and like, Oh, the Conjur- chest is magic. Conjuring, 100%. conjuring the images of Fanny, Fanny and Alexander back into their room. Amazing, it's magic. It's magic. Like there's no mechanical way he could have made that it's happen. It's magic. It's magic, or it's divine. And don't you love that it's the Jewish character who yes. does that? Yeah, like it's brilliant because it gives this like it offers Alexander even another avenue of like, yes, this person like he's been raised all his life knowing like everyone says, emphasizes how Uncle Isaac is Jewish. But he sees Isaac, he sees Isaac do that. He sees Ishmael. He sees the other Aaron, the the other nephew. Yeah. And it's like these people who believe in something different than you, but they seem to be really powerful and like close to God. And it just, it's so close brilliant. Close to something. Yeah. It's so brilliant. Some power. But don't you love the puppet and the way it's like, here I come, Alexander. When I first saw that, I was like, this is so cool on so many levels. And it's also like Bergman making fun of himself and his entire series about how God is silent right, and how right. no one sees God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is 100%. Oh my 100%. God. 100%. And no. it's literally, like, here I come. And it's. Yeah, yeah. but no, my, my point was that you can't, I think. You can't distinguish. It's too much of a coincidence that the aunt is going to light herself on fire and run into the bishop's room and kill him that very night. When at the same time, in the wee hours of the morning, yeah. <laughs> Alexander is with Ishmael and saying how much he hates the bishop and how he wishes he would die. Yes. So, I think so, too. I think, too, there's something about Ishmael, the way that Ishmael's holding Alexander from behind. It's very persona. It's persona. It's, there's something about like a burgeoning sexuality in that yes. scene because Ishmael is androgynous. Yes. And there's this kind of, the, Ishmael like takes so off like, his top. Let me put top. my hands on you. Yeah. Yeah, very sensual. It is. It definitely is. There's some stuff in this like, I don't think this could, some of the stuff in this could really fly today. Like in terms of like, even earlier in the movie when uh, Alma and... I think Alma says like one of the kids like kisses like a real man yeah. or something. Like there's li- a <laughs> few touches like that though. that I feel like today people are like um That's really hilarious. No, though. it's funny. It's funny. Um yeah. So what do you think the ma- all the magic and stuff is real and the ghosts? I think that the magic is like inextricably linked to Alexander and storytelling and life. Like it all is just connected so much mm-hmm. that it's like <sighs> I think it's impossible to know if it was Ishmael or if, if it was actually if if Ishmael actually had a part to play. I think it's impossible to know. But what about the Isaac stuff? Isaac stuff is hundred percent magic. Yeah, yeah, 
I mean, I think the fact that Ishmael resides with Isaac. Exactly. I love how they're this like mysterious family of like, they're different, right? They're different from everyone. and But yet they like have this mysticism. I love how Alexander pees. He can't find the toilet and he just pees in like the flower pot because he just can't find the bathroom. That's so funny. <laughs> um. No, what I love about this movie, too, is it feels like a great piece of literature. Oh, my and God. And again, I know we talked about this before. Like, it's something that we both really like in movies. And this is not based on anything. It's an original screenplay by yes. Bergman. But it feels like a long lost, sprawling book. So the and... the screenplay was published in book form. Mm-hmm. And I actually just added it to my, like, cart. Oh, on nice. This book website I buy things from. So I will be Wait, which book it. website? Abe Books. Oh, yeah. I've heard of him. Yeah. Uh yeah, if this is we've said this before, but it's an intimate epic. This is the perfect. This is I think when I came up with that term intimate epic and again, maybe someone said it, it before was, me. It was, it was this. about this. It was, it was about this. this. Yeah. Because um, again, what a huge scope, but again, it's it's clo- it's characters faces and it's yes. long stretches of just sitting with characters and stuff. And that's what I like so much Speaking about. Speaking of it. sitting with characters, let's talk about Isaac. But Isaac and Grandma. Well, Erlen Josephson, who is a longtime Bergman I love regular. Him so much. Scenes from a marriage. All a million things before yeah, this. But him and grandma are the Mia and Yoff of this movie. <laughs> They're so cute. You're talking when about he Seven her, Seal. Yeah, when he brings her a gift, his the Christmas gift, it's the brooch, and she looks around to make sure none of the maids are looking and they kiss. And yeah. they're just so cute and then another time they're like making out and one of the maids <laughs> walks in i love the scene it, it is again early in the it's film the cri- when they sit when everyone, everyone has left it's like that's three in the morning three in yeah. the morning and he's kind of falling asleep and, and she's like i'll she's, make coffee <laughs> and she's reminiscing and it, they met because she was having an affair yeah, with him yeah Exactly. And the husband found out and was yes. furious, but then the husband and Isaac became friends. Yeah. Do you love how Isaac is like doing the whole, first of all, he comes to Christmas, he participates in everything. He's at the end of the line, that like conga line, and he's just like so tired and just going along for the <laughs> yeah. ride. I love it. Yeah. I love him. Yeah, I love him too. She says you're my best friend during that like 3 a.m. Yeah. They're so sweet. And I love when grandma, I love grandma's line. Like, first of all, I love how it's one of the first moments of the film. She's watching all the maids like decorate the tree and she looks at them and then instantly like her face looks sad and she goes and starts to cry and you're like it's christmas like why is she crying and then at the end when she says that i just wanted to cry the whole time like i feel old i mean who can't relate to that who who can't relate to christmas losing its charm well there's a whole other element to that too because the actress who plays her was really sick with cancer during the making of the film and she Mm, died like a year later really Mm -hmm. That's so sad. And I think she had to like hide her pain while they were filming. Oh. <laughs> so there's this whole extra layer to that. But also, yeah, wow. Yeah, she was a huge Swedish actor, like this huge star of the stage and screen. I love Grandma and Isaac. They're they're amazing. Oh, and she says you're sweet like strawberries, and ov- like instantly you think of uh, wild strawberries. wild strawberries, and also in Seventh Seal, like the really emotional meal of strawberries and milk that they have. Yeah. Like Bergman is just like, like I said, this is a magnum opus. It's just everything. He uses it's the, everything yeah. everywhere all at once, baby. It really is the so Bergman version. The Bishop's last name is Vergaris uh-huh. and that's a Bergman name. He's used that. And usually yeah. the, it, the villain is called Vergaris. Really? He, he used it in the magician serpent's egg, the touch, the passion of Anna. Wow. Like the name Vergaris is in all of those. And it's usually the villain. And can we, can we talk about, cause you were saying how it's an intimate epic and a lot of it is just people sitting and talking like, when when in i guess it's like i guess it's the third act of the movie it's hard to break it's hard to break it down but like it's quite in the middle of the movie maybe the four acts of the episode when it (laughs) shifts to grandma's house first of all grandma's summer house and you get those beautiful shots of her house from the outside it's raining rain beautiful (laughs) but then all of those like that's a play that's a play in and of itself right it's like it grandma's summer house becomes this chamber piece of people just coming and visiting her and leaving and telling her their problems it's a play and it's contrasted with because that summer house is so big and bright and airy even though it's raining and it's right on the water and it cuts back and forth between that and the the bishop's Mm -hmm. house yeah Yeah. and it's shot like a play like a lot of the times it's just in wide like a master yeah yeah Mm -hmm. it really does it looks like a theater and i love it and i love 
all those visits that she gets. Except, you know, when uh, Gustav Adolf and his wife come and she's like taking, like she's organizing the family photos. That's a lot of photos to have for 1907. <laughs> well, that's just a lot of photos. Cameras had been around for a while. But people didn't get their photo <laughs> taken that much. Yeah, but they were they were pretty affluent. I mean, I guess. That's another thing too, because so they're this big kind of free creative family, this this big kind of loud, mm-hmm. indulgent, you know, where the arts are like number one, right? Mm-hmm. But they still engage in these kind of like bourgeoisie things. For example, when Alma and Emily come into the room and they see Mai is having a, p- a pillow fight with the kids. Yeah. And their first reaction is they laugh. Yeah. But then they go in and Alma slaps her across the face. Let's talk about this. Which is this moment of like... They are this big, sprawling, creative family, but there's also this certain social totally, expectation, this totally, cer- totally. certain like social stigma behind that. Exactly. That that slap always com- like that confuses the shit out of me. That slap because Alma's like she's so joyful, joyful, and like I love even at the end when her and Gustav Adolf like it's like the last scene they like go behind a door and they're like just screaming and they're just like i don't know about to have sex it's just hilarious and i love her and um she slaps may it's really startling but you're right it is it's like it's it's twinged with these like this pain they all have it and even carl like carl who's such a shit even he has jokes like right like lighting his farts the fart yeah. yeah and uh it's yeah it's great well no i i don't even I, it's funny alma is the most like joyous person in the film yes. and i think I, I don't know that she has this much pain i just think that it's like it, it's expected of her like she had to perform this slap like in front of the kids to like as a performative thing you not think? like she genuinely believed that she should slap my it was more of just like she had to do it you but think? It's interesting how those, For the kids? those bourgeoisie things kind of creep in. Like they're still there, even though this family is like almost this Cassavetes, like <laughs> turn of the century <laughs> Cassavetes. No, 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 there's, <laughs> no, that's the wrong. I just meant in that Cassavetes families are always loud and creative and everyone's an actor. That's the only connection I meant there. But... I don't know if she was performing for the kids. Maybe she was performing for herself. No, maybe, maybe for herself too. Yeah. It was for herself. And I think that like. Yeah, maybe she's open to it, but it still hurts. Like, it's got to still hurt. Do you think maybe it was because of the Gustav Adolf connection of, like, you're sleeping with my husband? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The look of this movie, too, is really interesting. Like, for the most part, like you were talking about the masters. Yeah, it's it's shot in a lot of masters and close-ups. And the camera is very fluid, and there's sure there's pans and and stuff like that. But there are a couple of very well placed zooms in this movie, mm-hmm. typically into Alexander's face. For example, when his father collapses on the stage, mm, I think I so think sad. you get like one of the first zooms that's into Alexander's face. Yeah. And then you also get a zoom. Oh, shit, something else happens. I forget. But yeah, there's just these really well placed. It, it again, it's almost manipulative to have like a zoom because it's almost like fo- signaling like. Oh, this is a big moment happening right now in Alexander's yeah. head, but they're well placed. Also, wait, yeah. I want to talk about the scene where Alexander is confronting his dying father. Oh because my God, I love it. It's just so powerful. I love, I love the way it's shot. I love the way that it kind of tracks him walking to the room. Alma is taking them. He turns around for a second and sees everyone looking at him. He doesn't want to go in that room, but his grandma makes him go in. Just those those close-ups of like, the vomit in the like the, yes. the urn and yes. the medicine and it's it's really powerful and he's hiding and he then doesn't want to talk to him he, he finally wanna... goes over yeah. and oscar has his hand up because it's too bright and his mouth just kind of falls open and alexander's yeah. horrified and goes and he hides he hides yeah alexander that that is it's a really really hard scene it's sad and again one of the one of the shots that's cut in this i don't know why is after uh, Oscar has died and Emily, the mom, like puts her head on his head. Oh, yeah. It's cut. I know. It's not in it. I know. What do you mean? I'm kind of surprised of all the stuff that's cut. They still have Carl's like farts in the theater. <laughs> I was like, oh, for sure they're going to cut that. <laughs> no. Nope, and sure enough, it was in it. the movie. <laughs> um, and I love how Fanny is like brave in that scene where yeah. dad is dying. It's, mm-hmm. it's really interesting. Well, because girls are more mature. They, they mature totally faster are. than boys. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. What, I feel like Bergman is kind of seen as this like existential guy and there's this like this recurrent theme of just like crying into the void right and yeah. like all his work and of course we talked a little bit about Carl 
because he kind of has that existential feeling of like, how does one become second rate? Oh my, like he, the way he grabs his face. In oh that God, scene and violently. Like, oh my God. Like he's just like, he can't take life. And I love how that's still in this movie. Like this movie is, like I said, it's just such a, a compilation of everything he's ever talked about. I love when grandma's talking to, and grandma feels it too, especially when she talks about how Christmas is sad and her and Isaac are talking um, I love she says everything is getting worse worse people worse machines worse wars and worse weather yeah and I just feel that that is a timeless statement wait Isaac says that right no grandma are you sure yeah I thought it was Isaac and then he says something like I'm I'm glad I'll be gone soon oh maybe it is Isaac I thought it was maybe yeah it's during I know it's during their conversation because, yeah it's the turn of the century like electricity is just coming in and like there's a sense of like yeah. we're tired and yeah. we don't want to deal with this new world she also says the happy splendid life is over and the horrible dirty life <laughs> yeah. engulfs us yeah and mom like when mom is crying like wailing when Oscar has died like that is literally like just screaming into the void well, we'll talk about that one in a second and um <laughs> is that your favorite sound <laughs> Really? That's uh, harsh. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, but Isaac's story is about that too, and I'm so sad it's cut yeah. because it really brings everything together. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about it because I want you to see the miniseries, like you being people who are listening. Yeah. To if, if you've only seen the theatrical version, please, by all means, like see the miniseries version because it is the definitive version. Not only did Bergman consider it the definitive version, but. It, it just is like the theatrical version is hurt by the omission of several of these threads. So if you have not seen the TV version, it's totally worth the time investment. And again, it's split up into four episodes. So it's like very manageable chunks. Yes. But no, I, I love what I love. Obviously, Bergman is Alexander. And so in so many ways, this movie feels just as personal as like Persona. Again, Persona was literally getting into his psyche this film is more straightforward, but the he it's a remembrance. Obviously, this movie takes place like 1906, 1907. 1907. And Bergman was born in 1918. Oh. So the, it takes place a little bit before. Yeah. Like this is Alexander's probably about 20 years older than Bergman would yeah. be. But it's this, it's this remembered time. It's this haziness. But what I love about Alexander in this movie is he's more of an observer. Like yeah. he's not moving things forward in this movie. No. It's about what's happening around him and what's yes. happening to him. Uh-huh. Exactly. Because that's what, when you're a kid, that's that's life. I know, right? Yeah. You're being told what to do, where to go, all that stuff. And he doesn't even have a part to play in like his escape from the bishops. Yeah. He doesn't really do anything. It's just Isaac who comes. How great when Isaac comes. First of all, what a great fucking scene. Uh, amazing. That's like the best scene. And the way that the tracking shot the that scream. follows Isaac there to the, like when, he, when he's in his carriage. Yes. And you know what's going to happen. Yes. And Isaac has great tracking shots. He has one in the beginning. Too. He does. Yeah. But he gets there and you know what's, ha- you know, yeah. it, this like nervous energy. And he's also playing it really cool yes. too. And he's like playing it off really well. And uh, when he finally pops, he he goes upstairs and and opens their door and yeah. tells them to get their shoes on and how quickly they like jump. It's just such a joyous yeah. moment. It's, it's amazing. so great. Amazing. It's amazing. Do you like how Alexander? This is always so funny to me when he goes like it's the first night they're sleeping at the bishop's house and he comes and he goes oh Fanny like come here I have something to show you and he's like look the windows are barred like that's it. And it has to do with his like passiveness, I think, a little bit. Because that's always so abrupt. And I think that's where one of the episodes ends. And you're just like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, one of the windows are barred. Like, nothing else. There's no, like, story. There's no, like, how are we going to get out of oh, here? Because it's indicative. It's, again, it's a fairy tale. They're up in the tower and they can't get exactly, down. Exactly. But there's no, like, how are we going to get out of here? Or we're trapped. No one even says anything. It's just like, Fanny, look. Yeah, it's because Ber- Bergman's a subtle filmmaker. I know. And the doll's house, like, obviously has, like, implications so creepy. of, like, yeah. Come on. Um, <laughs> what do you think about that? I mean, I guess it's pretty self-explanatory, but the fade to white when Isaac yells. Ugh. Oh my God. What a striking image. Magic. There's this great shot at the bishops. They go there. They're not even married yet, but um, it's the aunt who's sick in the bed and the bishop's mom passes by the camera and she's like, don't be afraid, children. And it, it's like the door opening and it's just like so clearly PTSD of like their dad dying and it's, it's brilliant. I don't know. I think like, again, the way this movie is shot is like kind of perfect. <laughs> is yes. that like an overstep to no, say that it's, it's like not. 
kind of a perfect movie just overall. Not just the way it's shot, just everything. It's one of our all-time great it's films, so bar none, bar none. Um, also, do you like how the bishop's mom looks younger than the bishop's she does. singer? Uh, singer, the bishop's sister? She does. It's so weird. And she has that thimble that she holds Alexander down that she's like pressing into his neck when he's getting spanked. The amount of neck grabs in this movie is yeah. really startling. The bishop kind of slaps always, Alexander on the back of the head. Yeah, even when he's saying good night. See, it's this controlling thing. Yeah. You know people like that, that grab of people course. by the back of their neck because they feel this control yeah. over them. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the most vulnerable places you could grab somebody. I know. I love the pans up to the theater. Oh, yeah. Sorry, now I'm just talking like shots. <laughs> no. About it. Um, the, pan, the way it like pans up. I love yeah. when the curtain drops and immediately you see them all celebrate from behind. Like that's just a, you've seen that done so many times in movies, but I don't know why this one is just so like genuine and warm and like immediately they bring in the Christmas table that they're all going to enjoy. Yeah. It's just lovely. It's <laughs> that just march lovely. around with all the food, the feast, the singing. It's the, all just the yeah, punch bowl. The punch bowl. The punch bowl. I love, so there's two different forms of Christianity in this movie, too, that I noticed. There's the Christianity of the Ek dolls, yes. where it's this warm, it's Christmas time, it's warm, it's yeah. pleasant, it's indulgent, and then you have the Christianity of the, <laughs> the bishop, bishop, which is cold, and I because I think Bergman was a Christian. Um, obviously, he made so many movies grappling with the silence of God and stuff. I think yeah, he was. I mean, I've read, like, so many things. Apparently, Max von Sydow, like, has said that in his late conversations with him, he said that he believes... Like, he's excited for death because he does believe that there's going to be, like, something after. So they had a pact. Um, Did you know that? They had a pact. Oh. And Bergman told Max von Sydow, he's like, if I go first, I'll let you know that there's life after death. And I saw an interview with Max von Sydow, and they asked him, like, so did Bergman show up? And Max von Sydow said, yeah. Shut up. No, I'm serious. It's a personal shopper situation? Yeah. What? Apparently, and they asked him for more details. He's like, it's too personal. But he said Aww. that Bergman came to him after he died. Shut up. I love that. You have to see Bergman Island. Yeah, I'll see Bergman They Island. talk about all this stuff. <laughs> you have to see it. Yeah, no, I'll see it. There's just so many movies out there, you know? I know. Including actual Bergman movies. <laughs> I know, right? You know what shot I low-key love? Is and it just low-key? Yeah, because it's so random. It's during the dad's funeral... It's like all these flags in the air. The Swedish I don't know flags? What those flags are even for? It's not just the Swedish flag. It's mm. like all these like house crests and they're just like waving in the wind. And actually I've heard I say low key because actually I've heard that uh Bergman was sick during that uh funeral yes. sequence. <laughs> so he wasn't even there when that was shot, but I still think it's a great shot. I mean it's Sven the Nikist one is like amazing. It's the but... one sequence he didn't shoot. But still, yeah, that's why I said Nyquist. Oh my God. Talk about legendary DPs. I mean, does it I, get any more legendary than Sven Nyquist? I honestly don't know. He went on to do like stuff you'd be surprised. Like stuff in the 90s where you're like, Sven Nyquist shot that? Like what? Give me something. Like <laughs> what's eating Gilbert Grape, Sleepless in Seattle. Sleepless in Seattle? Then a lot of Woody Allen stuff. A lot. Really? Some Tarkovsky. He shot Tarkovsky's last movie, The Sacrifice, which is a Bergman film, basically. Hmm. Like Tarkovsky uses Erlen Josephson and a really? couple other people. I think, too, um, the guy who plays Oscar is also in the film. Oh. But it's supposed to kind of feel like a Bergman movie. So he used Bergman's DP. Uh, he shot like Star 80 for Bob Fosse. Wow. Mixed Nuts, the, <laughs> the Steve Martin comedy. Interesting. Should we get into sight and sound? Might yeah. be about that time. <laughs> I mean, I could talk for hours. But... Yeah. What's your favorite sight? You know, this is really, really hard. <laughs> Stop oh, it. Sorry. Just pick one. Just pick one. Just pick one. Okay. Um, It's Fanny and Alexander after the dad's funeral. First of all, it, okay, it was kind of a tie. So there's this long shot and they're both around the dad's funeral, strangely enough. Do you know the long shot I'm talking about where it's like grandma telling the maid saying, tell the kids they can leave yeah and then it tracks them the kids leaving and then it's the band you see like an actual band has been playing the music you've been hearing yeah i love that i love any kind of scene like that and then directly after it which i think is my favorite sight of the whole movie it's fanny and alexander playing with his projector 
The magic lantern. The magic lantern. And it's them from behind. And Alexander's like, his head is down and he's really sad. That was almost my favorite it's, sight. And the yeah. smoke is coming out from the lantern. Yeah, it's that right was before almost they it. hear him playing piano, actually. I swear to God, that was like my number yeah, two. Yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite, I think. It's just everything. <laughs> Yours is better than mine. I just had... <laughs> there's The thing is, when I think of this movie, there's like two or three images that come to mind. Which and are? It's just hard to... It's hard to not think of them, but the most potent image, my mine's a combined sight and sound. Okay. It sounds bleak, but it's just like when I think of this movie, I think of this scene and just how powerful it is. It's literally Emily pacing back and yeah. forth, screaming yeah. at, as the body of Oscar lays right there. And again, the door is kind of just ajar. Fanny and Alexander are just outside. They, they're keeping their distance from the door. Yeah. And you just see her pacing back and forth. Like she'll occasionally appear in that gap it's between amazing. the doors. And his body's laying there, it's and amazing. she's just wailing. Yeah, it's amazing. Let's hear it. Yeah, Ugh. I mean, again, it's... Ugh. It's dark, know, but it's, it's just, it's such an accurate representation of grief, of just, just the like mindlessness, not mindlessness, but just like how primal grief can and be. And that's Bergman. That's like Bergman. that's the whole, that's his filmography. That's Cries yeah. and Whispers. I feel like there's a shot like that very similar in Cries and Whispers. Yeah. Well, that, that film's literally called Cries and Whispers. Exactly. <laughs> Again, it's this void that you just scream into. Yeah. It's like, what am I? Where am I? Who am I? Yeah. So um, I don't know. I don't know what that says about me that in this like generally warm film, that's my no. favorite sight and sound but it's just very it's so striking and it like is. i remember the first time i saw this i think it was that scene where i was like oh this is like a masterpiece like <laughs> i was enjoying it and that scene yeah. happened and i was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> i my favorite sound come on it's Isaac screaming oh that was very close the, for you too on. yeah it's everything as the, as, as the, sc- the screen fades to white the power of god just overtakes him and he's just like ah it's it's brilliant let's hear it Ah! it's so good yeah (laughs) that when i first saw it i was like my jaw just dropped you guys can't see me (laughs) i saw it sorry um (laughs) yeah it's amazing it's incredible well pauline (laughs) it's pauline time i don't want to be disappointed we're getting into pauline i don't want to so overall she has a pretty comprehensive review. I'm only going to read a few snippets from, but overall, she has a her general takeaway is she l- enjoyed every minute of it. Like she was riveted by it, but she thinks that it's too simple and that it's like Bergman has kind of regressed a little bit, and she thinks it's a little bit like too on the nose. That's her general takeaway. Oh my god! She loves the stuff with the bishop the most. I think that whole stretch. So she calls it. A festive and full-bodied dream play, a vision of family life as a gifted child might spin it around, turning himself into a hero, a magician, an actor. In what Bergman says is his final movie, his obsessions are turned into stories and he tells them to us. Mm -hmm. He makes us a beribboned present of his Freudian gothic dream world. Fanny and Alexander is at its weakest when it's explicitly a tribute to theater. When Alexander's father, tears in his eyes, makes this humble comeback speech to the, to the company. And then she goes on to quote his speech. I love the speech. I think the speech is the movie. It's, it's funny. In general, she bemoans the speeches in this movie all together. Like, she bemoans the one at the end. Love it. <laughs> um, she also says, the father's small mustache and the way he combs his hair are unfortunate. They give him a resemblance oh no. to Hitler, oh no. which couldn't have been intended. <laughs> I saw that coming. And his, humil- his humility seems pathetic and false. Uh, Because she says, for one thing, his playhouse is a flourishing, large, many-tiered theater and has just been packed full with a dressed-up audience. Fanny and Alexander is at its strongest when it's most theatrical. There wasn't a moment when I wasn't held by the Christmas material. The pacing of these scenes is relaxed, assured. They almost seem to be happening in real time. Yet Bergman sustains a tone of wonder and expectancy. His offhand technique is masterly. From time to time, the images seem ceremonial, like prized photographs of family occasions. Still, I didn't feel any pang of excitement during these scenes. 
the evocative images, like Alexander with his hand on the frosty window he's looking out, Alexander with his magic lantern, only evoke earlier Bergman films, and the large, generous-hearted family is a bit sticky. There's an element of self-applause in this wonderful family of the theater scenes. The picture didn't really begin for me until the shock of Alexander's action at a crucial moment. And she goes on to talk about him at it, coming to his father's deathbed. Um, she, yeah, she says the movie plunges into gothic horror, and it's a little goofy and very entertaining. But I don't think it ever again achieves the full authority of those two scenes. She's talking about the scenes of one Alexander on the deathbed of his father, and then also Emily walking back and forth screaming. She says, I enjoyed Fanny and Alexander enormously, but I wanted to love it the way I loved Bergman's The Magic Flute, and I couldn't. This may be because, although I can perceive what's happening when a boy's fantasies are being worked out, I don't feel the tingle of recognition that the material may have for men. The movie is all Alexander's fantasy life. Fanny isn't really in the picture at all. She's merely a blonde, blue-eyed presence, and her name being in the title is probably vestigial. Bergman may have meant to do far more with her than he did. My inability to respond to the film with more abandon isn't only because it's a male fantasy, though. The film is certainly a culmination, a warm-spirited summing up, but it's also a willed masterpiece, and that may be part of what causes the trouble. It's scaled so ambitiously that I kept waiting for it all to come together, but it's somewhat misshapen. After the holiday richness of the first section, there's almost nothing left for the final Dickensian celebration, the return to the safety and sensuality of the bustling Ekdal household. What it has is lovingly placed warm gingerbreading, which I fear will lead audiences to take it as a healing experience. They can come out of the movie beaming with pleasure at the thought of Ingmar Bergman's finally achieving harmony with himself, but the conventionality of the thinking in Fanny and Alexander is rather shocking. It's not modern conventionality, it's from the past, and that may have a lot to do with why the film seems healing. It's as if Bergman's neuroses had been tormenting him for so long that he cut them off and went sprinting back to Victorian health and domesticity. The picture is an almost sustained flight of Victorian fantasy, and it may win Ingmar Bergman his greatest public acceptance. Coming from Bergman, banality is bound to seem deeply satisfying, wholesome. It can pass for the wisdom of maturity. So complicated thoughts from Pauline on this one. Yeah. Again, I think she does seem to have a problem with the joy (laughs) in the movie. Yeah, yeah. And there's a line too, I didn't read it, but she's like, what happened to the guy who made Virgin Spring and this and how his wit is not what it once was. I'm like, that's not the point of this film. This movie's witty. It is. And also this... (laughs) Again, what's wrong with him softening it up, you know? But it's not even that soft. Like we said, it ends with, yeah, you could look at it as like, oh, this person's going to be haunted by this thing that he believed that he did. And it's the power of like stories and the things you tell yourself and the things you believe in. I agree. And yeah, again, the Ectos are like, yes, as we just mentioned, they're a lovely family to be around, but they have these demons for sure. And they're all haunted by like, something yeah absolutely no question about it anyway letterboxed yes i have a four and a half star review here that they specify they watched the five hour version and they say fanny and alexander feels like classic literature my 70 year old english professor would assign to me that i debate whether or not to read or to spark note then I just read it and end up loving it. <laughs> At around five hours, I can't deny that some of this version feels excessive or a little unnecessary. Had I watched the three-hour film version of this, I most likely would have appreciated it more. After the first hour and a half, I was convinced the film would be a chore to get through, but I was very wrong. And they go on to say, every character feels real, well thought out, and had their own specific goals carefully laid out. The set design's amazing, blah, 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 grand and elaborate decor. Uh, contrasted with the cold, detached, and minimalistic aesthetic of the bishop's home. Nice. Um, I really love this one. Four and a half stars. I'm still not exactly sure each time I see an Ingmar Bergman film whether I should rush myself to the nearest church or continue going nowhere near one. I don't <laughs> think he was sure either. <laughs> I saw that I one. I love that. Yeah, it's true. Here's a five-star review. Every time I think I've seen Bergman's best, I'm proved wrong. I shouldn't say that this, the full TV cut of Fanny and Alexander, is his ultimate masterpiece, but 
that's very much what I'm thinking as I write this. Bergman has made so many incredible, perfect films, but this does something I've never seen from him. Despite its staggering running time, it is perhaps his most immediately watchable film. It's deeply complex with scenes that muse and reality that wavers, yet it is addictive to watch it unfold. An unbelievable balancing act of thoughtfulness and engrossing, accessible drama. Mm. I love the way this plays with magic and dreams through the eyes of several characters, especially Alexander. It is electric with life, horror, and trauma, both grim and joyous. For the for its entire running time, I was entranced, to say the least. I don't know if this is Bergman's best, but it is most certainly one of the most wonderful pieces of film or TV I've ever seen. Yes. I'd just like to point out, see, on Letterboxd, you know how it has like a photo of the movie? It's literally that shot I was talking about. With Emily Fanny laying in bed with them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, which is not in this version. Half a star pretentiousness and boredom the movie <laughs> god <laughs> find something new to say you know um you want something new i'll give you something new two stars fart jokes are exactly what this timeless classic needed <laughs> <laughs> there's fart jokes all throughout classic literature and that, you know yeah james joyce was all about yeah. fart jokes we're not above this i didn't have a heart to read any bad reviews <laughs> Those were the only ones because they're just stupid. <laughs> but I feel more confident with like great movies reading the bad reviews because those people are obviously wrong. I know they're obviously wrong, but for this one, I like didn't too pull, close. I didn't pull any bad reviews home. just because it's like if you if you don't like this, you're an idiot. So Pauline. <laughs> well, no, Pauline still says like I was in, entranced by every second of this. I just like her. It's almost like she loved it in the minute and walked away and was like, yeah, but you know, and kind of like thought about it. Maybe. And, but no, I mean, she was still, I would take that as like a lukewarm I also thing. feel like she really, she judges people based on how good they are. Mm-hmm. I really think she like lifts the bar if it's Ingmar Bergman, let's say. And like, she doesn't want him to be quote, quote, conventional, which I don't think this movie is. Yeah. No. Okay. Maybe it's not like full of despair and it's, mm-hmm. I don't know. What, what I love about this movie, even though it's like, because it's this like summation of his entire career and it's supposed to sum everything up. It's one of his most accessible movies, I think. Despite the runtime, if someone was really into, like they wanted to get into Bergman, they hadn't seen any Bergman, this is almost a great starting point just because it's in color Mm -hmm. and it's a little more modern feeling than Mm -hmm. like Seventh Seal or Wild Strawberries or Mm -hmm. something. So honestly, I've recommended this over the years to a couple people who had not seen any Bergman. Like, just watch Fanny and Alexander. Again, today's TV-minded people, you just watch it in episodic chunks. Yeah. And it's perfect. I really, I do think it's a great introduction to Berkman. Hmm. And I don't think you need to have seen, whereas Persona, you kind of need to know what was happening right before that and what he'd done prior to really get a full grasp on what Persona is. Anyone can come into Fanny and Alexander and yeah. appreciate the Dickensian mm-hmm. story that's happening here. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's a great entry point. And the splendid production design. Yeah. I agree. Well... Because it's going to about wrap up our Fanny and Alexander episode. We'll see Bergman again for Wild Strawberries. I think that's it. Really? Yeah, I think that's just the four. Two, three, four. Oh my God. Yeah, because we've already done Seven Seal, Persona, and this. You know, I learned today about a movie he made with B.B. Anderson and Elliot Gould. What's it called? The Touch, I think. How great does that sound? Yeah, I haven't seen that I haven't yet. seen it either, but I, I saw it. I'm like, Elliot Gould, Bergman. I think it's called The Touch. Actually, I literally reacted like I saw a photo of it. It was like B.B. Anderson and him like hugging. And my reaction to it was literally Opal from Nashville. I was like, it's Elliot Gould. I literally, <laughs> that was me when I saw it. Yeah, I saw that. I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, they're like embracing in yeah. a very like. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Evie with Elliot? I'm here for it. Yeah. A Swedish housewife begins an adulterous affair with a foreign archaeologist. Love it. But I'm he is there. an emotionally scarred man, a Jewish survivor from a concentration camp. Oh my gosh. Consequently, their relationship will be painfully difficult. <laughs> That's the summary? It's on the Criterion channel. Hell yeah. I think it's in the Bergman box set too. Everything is in the Bergman box set. Everything but like one or two, honestly. Really? It's very strange. There's, yeah, there's a, I think it's called Face to Face or something like that, that they like d- could not get the rights to. Can you answer something for me? Because I was trying to figure it out. Is the Scenes from a Marriage miniseries in the Bergman box set? Both. Okay. So 
in the case of yeah, I guess we didn't really talk about scenes from a marriage at all in this, but that was the other time I when he love did scenes from a marriage, an epic miniseries, yes. and then did a shortened film version. Yeah. In that case, I've never seen the film. Version. I've never seen the because come version. on, come on. <laughs> no, I know. I love scenes from a marriage, but no. In the in the Criterion Bergman box, they have they have both. So for scenes from a marriage, they have theatrical and TV, and for Fanny and Alexander, they have theatrical and TV. Good. So yeah, though the box is everything, and the box is the making of Fanny and Alexander, which mm-hmm. I feel embarrassed that I haven't watched yet. I'm probably going to go home and watch that right after this. Do it. But yeah, no, the the box is an incredible value. At it, when they do the sales, it's like 150 bucks, and you're getting like 40 Bergman movies. <laughs> you're getting basically his entire career, yeah. and it's laid out. I mean, you have like the Agnes Varda Criterion yeah. box set, where it's like laid out almost like a film festival. Like they yes. group films together, like mm-hmm. thematically and stuff. So you start. It's not like you're just working through like chronologically. Yeah. It's like I think the first film was like I don't fucking remember. <laughs> I think it might have been Smiles from a Summer Night or something. But yeah, they kind of like they throw a big one in every few movies. But anyway, I guess that'll wrap it up for this week. Next week, we are doing our first Tarkovsky. And it is his film, I believe from 1975, called Mirror. Mm. Anyway, so yeah, next week we're doing our first Tarkovsky. Here we go. Yeah. So come back next week. We're doing Mirror. Until then, I'm Greg. I'm Jackie. Have a great week. This has been an official podcast of the Arroyo Film Club. Seen and Heard is Jacqueline Pastagian and Greg Kleinschmidt. Theme music by Andrew Cox. You can find us at seenandheardpod.com.